when there's contradictions in history, you know that you've got a distortion of history. The two go hand in hand. If there's direct contradictions, then that's a, a evidence to the fact that there is a distortion of history. And today we're going to see some distortions of history and contradictions uh, from the Cambridge History of the Second World War, Volume 3, Total War, Economy, Society and Culture. Um, in particular, there's just three pages, actually, which when I read them, I was like, yep, yeah, I'm doing a video on this because this is ridiculous. So, without further ado, let us get on with it. So the authors in question are Twos, Adam Twos, who wrote The Wages of uh, Destruction, and Martin, who I'm not sure who is, but... Yeah, we'll, we'll get into it. So this quote is actually correct. This is, um, there's three pages that are wrong, basically. Um, and this one comes from a couple of pages before that, but I wanted to give it because it gives us context of what came uh, later on. So, the entanglement between war and economics revealed by the First World War was to become one of the defining features of the first half of the 20th century. Never before had war been so resource intensive, never before... Uh, were economies so self-consciously reorganised around the needs of war, the war economies of the First World War were novel and unanticipated improvisations, experiments in organisation. Now this is true because prior to the First World War, you had um, laissez-faire, leave alone economics, you had the gold standard and basically a restriction on government spending. Uh, for the most part, First World War comes along and... It's just an excuse for the economies, just, you know, the state to get into the economy. And these were improvisations. These were experiments. It wasn't really planned properly. So, yeah. But after the First World War, a lot of the state um, improvisations, experiments and organization and controls carried on in certain states, such as Weimar Germany. And that's important because the First World War is a turning point when it comes to state involvement in the economy. But jumping ahead to the National Socialist era, we have this quote. In June of 1933, Schacht, Goering and Blomberg had agreed to an eight-year plan of rearmament to be financed by the That Place, an off-the-books front company underwritten by the Reichsbank. Already by 1935, however, military spending was running far ahead of target and in 1936, it would reach 11% of the total national income. This figure was historically unprecedented in a peacetime capitalist state. So what this quote is saying is that uh, the central state with the central bank, the Reichsbank, um, and so on, have an eight-year central state plan uh, of rearmament. And by 1936, it was 11% of total national income. Uh, supposedly. Well, okay. Uh, and what they're also saying is that this was unprecedented in a peacetime capitalist state. So they're saying that the central state control of the economy and the rearmament program was free market, non-state capitalism. Okay. No comment. On the eve of the First World War in 1914, by contrast, the military spending of all the major European powers had hovered between 3 and 4% of GDP. Nor was Nazi Germany alone. The Soviet Red Army was undergoing dramatic modernization. Italy's attack on Abyssinia pushed its military burden over 12%. When Japan attacked China in 1937 and it began a phase of semi-mobilization for war, military spending would surge to over 20% of GDP. So... National Socialist Germany is not alone in this. The Soviet Marxist Socialist Red Army was also undergoing dramatic modernization. Italy, which is fascism, um, is also spending a ton. National Socialist Germany isn't alone, and they are spending more in peacetime than major European powers did in the First World War. Wow. How was such a drastic reallocation of resources possible, it asks. In Stalin's Soviet Union, the answer was consistent and radical. The entire economy was restructured around collectivized agriculture and an expanding state-controlled industrial complex. Civilian consumption was squeezed to a point of provoking a dreadful famine in the countryside. Meanwhile, the share of armaments in industrial production rose from 2.6% in 1930 to 5.7% in 1932, 
10% in 1937 and 20% by 1940. Though there was a lull in 1937 as the Communist Party was convulsed by the purges, after 1938, 35-40% to of all steel production in the Soviet Union was directed to the armament sector. Production of aircraft and artillery surged. So the Soviet Union was collectivized in the agriculture, uh, had a state-controlled industrial complex, uh, civilian consumption was squeezed, uh, and they had an armaments production which produced lots of steel and aircraft and artillery. Though bent on remilitarization and international confrontation, National Socialist Germany was not a socially revolutionary regime. Okay, seizures and state ownership were limited uh, on an ad hoc basis to particular troublesome or strategic industries, notably aircraft, Junkers, and steel, Reichswerker Hermann Goering. The key was to use state expenditure to mobilize and redirect the huge capacity left idle by the Great Depression. Okay, so hold on a sec. So the the Soviets nationalized the steel production industry and made that thing, that socialism. But Germany's not a socially revolutionary regime, even though they did the same. Aircraft was also nationalized and socialized, the Junkers factory, and yet that wasn't socially revolutionary or anything. Uh, seizures and state ownership were limited on an ad hoc basis. Yeah, not true. So seizures may be, but state ownership or control which is socialism, right? Control, control was definitely not limited. Um, and the key was to use state expenditure to mobilize and redirect. Hold on. State expenditure. If you finance something through the industries, right? If you, if you get some money and go, please, Mr. Armaments Industry, please make weapons for the state. Well, that's state control. The financing is the control. So, yeah, this is state control, the means of production. But it's not social revolutionary or anything, even though I've put in the a little picture of the Hitler Youth, which is not, you know, this isn't apparently, this isn't social revolutionary, even though what they did was they abolished the private youth organizations of the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, and so on, and socialized and nationalized the youth into the state social youth organization, the Hitler Youth. But that's not... A socially revolutionary regime or anything, right? Okay, okay. So what we've gone so, through so far is that this is a capitalist regime. It's not socially revolutionary or anything. So it's free market capitalism. So a market is a buyer and a seller, right? And a free market is these two able to buy and sell at their own leisure and, and whatever else. There is no state getting involved in the free market, right? That's free market. A social regime, a social revolutionary regime, a socialist regime, a Keynesian regime is the idea that, no, 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 this is evil somehow because it's exploitationary. And the way to get around this is to have the state, big brother, come along and say, no, 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 you cannot trade freely. We have to get involved. So now there's a third party. Let's say that, right? A third party comes along go in the middle and goes, no, 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 we, you two can't trade we have to get involved somehow through taxation, uh, through regulation, through wage controls, price controls, that sort of thing. So when you have an, uh, a, a state dictating to these, then they've no longer got a free market. Okay, that's it. That, that's it. But yet, we're seeing elements here of a non-free market, but apparently it's a free market. And apparently it's not social revolutionary or anything. Okay. Already in December 1933, all new allocations of money for the work creation schemes of the Reich were frozen. So allocations of money from the central state, free market, right? Uh, for work creation schemes, free market. <laughs> like, really? Thereafter, the civilian economy was consistently put in second place. Buyer and seller, the buyer... No, 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 you're now in second place. We can forget about you. And the state is now saying, no, no, we'll buy from the producers. That's not a free market. Apart from the allocation of spending, which clearly is not free market, the other main means of redirecting the German economy 
were the currency controls put in place during the crisis of 1931. That's not a free market. These gave the Reichsbank full control over imports. Again, not a free market. How you can how you can go from this is not this is a capitalist economy. It's not a socially revolutionary regime. To hey, look at all these state controls of the means of production, and say that's how you can do that in literally two pages. I have no idea, but yet that is exactly what we've done here. In 1934, they were consolidated by a shacked Hitler's central banker into the new plan. So the so when you have private banks, okay, at the bottom of the rung let's say and they are directly fin financing the consumer okay that's that's free market that's fine when you have a central plan uh central bank it's no longer free market the central bank is the bank state okay these are the private uh, banks they deal with the customers and are um reliance on the free market you know the buying and selling and the and the whatever else they are they are subject to the controls of the free market well, the central bank is not. The central bank steals wealth through taxation or through uh, inflation, which is a silent taxation, uh, and redistributes wealth from everybody else in society to them through the form of taxation, uh, from thievery. And they, this central bank controls these banks. It says, "Hey, we, you know, we'll be the buyers and sellers of last resort." So, they, and they control the policies. They set interest rates, which Shaq does. He sets interest rates at quite high. In during this period, and so on, and they have policies that directly impact the other banks, and the, you know that's not including the regulations, the controls, and whatever else, and the uh, policy decisions. So yeah, Schacht is is controlling the central bank, the bank state, the central bank is controlling the economy, but apparently it's not social revolutionary, and it's free market capitalism. All right, well, let's move on. Contrary to the idea that Hitler instigated a Keynesian recovery, Keynesianism is socialism basically with modifications. So we'll come back to that. Contrary to the idea that Hitler instigated a Keynesian recovery, everything possible was done to prevent surging government spending and industrial employment spilling into increased consumption. So they're saying it's not Keynesianism because Keynes wanted consumer in consumption and Hitler, who was before Keynes, because Keynes wrote his book in 1936, uh, and Hitler got into power in 1933, uh, so Hitler was mainly spending it on armaments and industrial employment and so on and so forth. So th this isn't this isn't real Keynesianism, um, okay? But it's very close to it. That's why somebody clearly has, you know, made the accusation. Okay, this is Keynesianism, and now Tooze and Martin feel the need to come out and defend Keynesianism, which is their bias, because who is Cambridge? Oh, yes, Cambridge and Oxford are the industry. You know, Oxbridge. These are the central elite establishment places, the schools where our central elite in Britain are being taught Keynesianism. Right, in order to then plug these people in positions of power in our country. So, yeah, this is the social elite, and the reason they like Keynesianism is because it benefits them. Keynesianism and socialism in general is a war in the name of the poor against the middle class for the benefits of the rich and powerful. These are the rich and powerful. These are the social elite. They want Keynesianism because... What they're doing is, there's, let's say there's three tiers in society. There's the, the top elite, the middle class, and the bottom, right? Top, middle, and bottom. What socialism does is destroys the middle class and makes a two-tier society. The workers, or the peasants, and the lords and ladies in their castle, or the bureaucrats and politicians. That's what they want. They want the destruction of the middle class. Everybody else goes down to the bottom, and they rule like lords and ladies over the castle, right? Everybody else is a peasant. That's what they want. And Keynesianism and socialism is the redistribution of wealth from everybody else in society to the center, right? It's ta Yes, they'll give you a little bit back, but they take their cut, and their cut is pretty big, right? That's what the whole point of it is. It's, it's, a, it's a social revolutionary idea, let's put it that way, of redistribution of wealth to the center. That's all it is. And so they want to defend Keynesianism. 
So clearly somebody's gone, hey, look, Hitler is a Keynesian, right? Which may or may not be true, but he's certainly very similar to Keynesianism. And so Martin and Tews and the central elite of Cambridge have come out in defense of Keynesianism to say, no, 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 Hitler's not a real Keynesianist. Uh, and this is their bias. Uh, this is an admission that, yes, they are, in fact, Keynesianism, Keynesians, and they are out to defend Keynesianism, which is interesting, as we will see. Sectors such as textiles and food production were throttled back, which technically is not true, but okay, while chemicals and engineering boomed, right? So this is proof that it's not Keynesianism. Well, food production wasn't throttled back. It just happened to be because... Socialism doesn't work, but anyway. Meanwhile, Hitler declared a general price stop in 1936. So that's not free market then, is it? More proof that it's not free market. You know, free market, buyer and seller, now there's a price stop. Not free market. And the destruction of the labor movement held down wage growth. That sentence is so wrong. <sighs> right. Wages were held down because the central state decided that that was the case. So again, not free market, the central state saying, no buyer, no seller, we will dictate your wages and we will dictate your prices. Okay, the vampire economy, that's why it's called that. So this is not a free market thing. And that's not, you know, the destruction of the labor movement, even if it had happened, that's not the reason why wages were held down. The central state dictated that wages were held down. Then you've got the destruction of the labor movement. Well, that didn't happen. Okay, yeah, partly it did. But not entirely. What you see is that, yeah, some of the troublesome trade unions who refused to be socialized under the state, yeah, they actually rebelled. And that's when Hitler hit them with the Reichstag fire decree and, and so on. But what actually happened was the survivors of that, the rest of them, were socialized or nationalized into the state trade union, the uh, German Labour Front, the DAF. So in actuality, yeah, it wasn't destroyed. It was just socialized into the state. But they can't admit that, Tuz and Martin, because that would be admitting that this was a socially revolutionary regime and not capitalism, which they can't do because they're Keynesianists and don't want to be associated with Hitler's regime. But it gets worse. Market liberals would, of course, object that such systems were grossly inefficient. This is brilliant. This is brilliant. So, so brilliant, right? So market liberals, free market capitalists, are now objecting to Hitler's regime. They're saying, yes, Hitler's regime was grossly inefficient. We object to this, this free market liberals. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. If Hitler's regime was capitalist, why are the free market capitalists saying that Hitler's regime is grossly inefficient? If Hitler's regime is capitalism. Why are the capitalists saying this is bad? Why would the capitalists say capitalism is bad? They wouldn't. Okay? This sentence, market liberals would of course object that such systems were grossly inefficient, is an admission by Keynesianists, Tews and Martin, and the Cambridge elites, that actually there is a problem with their narrative. Because... Capitalists would not go, yeah, capitalism is grossly inefficient, we shouldn't have it. No, this is the point. Market liberals are saying this is not a free market. This is not capitalism. This is state control of the means of production. This is socialism. This is a socially revolutionary regime. And Tuz and Martin, in order to keep this fantasy uh, that Hitler's regime was somehow capitalism, because fascism is the end stage of capitalism, apparently, according to Stalin... The only way they can keep this is to say, nope, nope, uh, this regime is not real, you know, it's capitalism, it's not real Keynesianism. But now they've got a problem because the market liberals are saying, actually, you know, this, this regime is socialism and it's grossly inefficient. Well, because they are Keynesianists, they have to come out in defense of the command economy. They have to come out in defense of Keynesianism because it's so, Hitler's regime is so close to Keynesianism, they have to come out in defense of it. And they have to come out in defense of you know, state control of the means of production, because Keynesianism is, is state control of the means of production. That's what it is. So now you've got a situation where Keynesianists are defending Hitler's economy because it is a socialist economy, but they're saying it's not real socialism. It is, in fact, capitalism. And the capitalists are going, nope, it's not capitalism. It's so 
It's it's ridiculous. This should not be happening, but it gets better. The modern li- neoliberalism of Friedrich Hayek originated in the critique of the planned economies of the 1930s. It actually goes back much further than that. It goes back to 1922, with uh, and maybe even further back, with uh, Mises and his book Socialism, which if you haven't read, is fantastic. Um, but we carry on. But the instruments of state control employed by regimes such as Hitler's What 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 else can I say at this point? So it's free market capitalism. <laughs> it's not a socially revolutionary regime, but here's a ton of state control, and we're now going to admit that it's state control because state control is amazing because we're Keynesianists and we love state control. What state control is not capitalism? State control is not free market liberalism, right? So there you go. And a lot of people have criticized me in the past saying, no, it's not state control. There's no state control. Here are Keynesianists themselves saying it is state control. Here it is. But the problem is they're having to do that in order to say, well, we're defending state control of the means of production in the form of Keynesianism. So we're now having to defend Hitler's regime because it was state control. But at the same time, we're going to say it's not state control. What are you doing? This this doesn't make the, the contradictions are all over the place. It's ridiculous. This is ridiculous. But the instruments of state control employed by regimes such as Hitler's were themselves the product of the crisis of the free market economy. In the Keynesian view of history, or the socialist view of history, the capitalism leads to uh, economic crises. That's not true. The Austrian business cycle says that actually government spending is what leads to market crashes. But I digress. But even if we accept that it did... Okay, so capitalism fails in 1929. So Hitler then says, well, what we need to do to solve the crisis of capitalism is bring in capitalism. What? (laughs) What? Okay, this is proof that their narrative makes no sense. Um, Hitler said, no, the crisis of capitalism has to be cured by socialism, a version of socialism called national socialism which was more of a racial socialism. That's what he says. So this is this doesn't even make any sense. If you read it as what they're saying, it doesn't make any sense. The crisis of capitalism is to be solved by capitalism. Uh, then the market capitalists, liberals, are saying, no, these, this Hitler's regime is, is not efficient, right? So we've got capitalists saying capitalism isn't efficient. And then you've got Keynesians defending Hitler and his economy because it's so close to Keynesianism that they have no choice. And since they love state control of the means of production and state finance, well, they have to defend it because it's so close. So you've got effectively, you've got Keynesianisms, Keynesianists defending capitalism. This is ridiculous. I could literally write a book on the stupidity of these three sentences. These three sentences are so contradictory of everything. It's br- this is br- you, this these three sentences are literally the worst three sentences I have ever seen. The, the, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. Absolutely, how they wrote these three sentences, I have no idea. But it goes on. Furthermore, <laughs> even if there were inevitable ineffic- inefficiencies, which there always are in socialism, the recovery taking place from the 1930s onwards, was undeniable. It's undeniable, is it? Oh, it's undeniable. The Nazi recovery was undeniable. So I'm sorry, Mr. Richard Overy, who wrote this book saying it is deniable. Uh, Sorry, you're wrong. Okay, Uh, this is the Nazi economy... uh, Sorry, the Nazi economic recovery, 1932 to 1938, written in 1982. So this is way before 2017 or 2015, depending on which edition you've got of, of Susan Martin's book. So it's not like they didn't know about this, but yes, the Nazi economic recovery, at the very least, is up for debate. It's not undeniable. No, it's up for debate, okay? And also, this was also published by Cambridge University Press. Cambridge, what are you doing? Uh, right? And and also, I don't know if Overy is a Keynesian, but he, he seems to come across it in this book as a, a Keynesian, or he's certainly read a lot on Keynesian economy, economics. Um, so, yeah... 
even the contradictions themselves can't like the Keynesians are contradicting themselves basically it's ridiculous um, and also even without reading this book which only came the other day uh, even without reading this book I can tell you that no the 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 economy didn't recover properly like it's just ridiculous I need to do a video on it but seriously it is deniable it, it, it didn't the economic recovery of the Nazis was not was not a recovery it's ridiculous but apparently the recovery they caused the Keynesians are having to defend Keynesianism and defend state control of the means of production they are now saying that the Nazi economy recovered and it's undeniable that that happened brilliant we now have Keynesian Keynesians de defending Hitler so uh the recovery taking place from the early 1930s onwards was undeniable, as was the fact that the managers of the planned economies developed their own particular skill set. Soviet factory managers and construction engineers became expert at the storming investment surges that drove Stalin's five-year plans. Meanwhile, in the Third Reich, officials perfected the delicate balancing of limited stocks of hard currency. Hard currency in order to invest... <laughs> Because the state expenditure exploded uh, and invest, you know, state investment happened massively, just like it did in Stalin's five-year plan. It also happened in, in Hitler's four-year and eight-year plans. But that's not socialism or anything. Like, hello? It, 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 this, this so contradictory, it's unreal. So, this was a planned economy. They're saying this is a planned economy. This is a plan, absolutely 100% a planned economy. It's very similar to Stalin's five-year plans, right? With the storming investments. Same thing happened in the Third Reich. Absolutely 100% planned economy. There was a recovery, right? In the Nazi economy, supposedly. That is undeniable. What? This is this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. It's honestly, it's unbelievable. Um, and yet, apparently it's capitalism. I, I Honestly, I... Uh, words cannot express the f the fact that we have Keynesians defending Hitler, defending Hitler's economy because it's so close to Keynesianism. They have no choice. They love state-controlled economies. And they love planned economies because they, they are the social elites. They want this to be the case because Keynesianism, socialism, this gives them all the moral you know argument they need in order to keep running the countries. Right? That's why they're doing it. So, yeah, they, they are defending Hitler now <laughs> and his planned economy because they have no choice but to do it, even though Hitler's economy was partly financed by the theft of the Jews and the economy was collapsing because socialism and Keynesianism always collapses on itself. So as the, the German economy is falling apart, Hitler's like, right, we need to go and Anschluss Austria, we need to take the Sudetenland, we need to go into Poland, we need to attack the West, we need to go into, into uh, the Soviet Union and steal resources off the rest of Europe. Um, so what they actually did, according to Hitler's beneficiaries, is they exported inflation and imported uh, and you know, basically stole the resources off the rest of Europe and the Jews, and the, we have Keynesians defending this policy. Yeah, so Keynesianism works. Wow, absolute wow, right? And people have said to me, "No tick, you're wrong. No tick, it's not socialism. No tick, stick to tanks." I'm sorry. I'm sorry. When there's a massive distortion this big, that it, it's so bad. That within a few pages, with literally in three pages, page 30 to 32 of this book, you have so many contradictions that it's just, I could literally write a book on the contradictions inherent in these three pages. The Keynesian argument, the socialist argument that Hitler was not a socialist and that he was in fact a capitalist is utter rubbish. And it's, interestingly, it's the same argument that is used to say that the Venezuelan dictatorship, the socialist dictatorship, isn't real socialism either, and is in fact capitalism. Rubbish. Ridiculous. Pointless. Stupid. When there's a distortion that is this bad, when it is this big, I cannot ignore it. I, you can't stick to tanks. I can't stick to tanks because I can't even explain why they went to war in the first place if it isn't socialism. If it's capitalism, Hitler had no reason to go to war. And that's why there is no explanation as to why Hitler went to war. Except for, for people like me who publish videos explaining this, saying, no, it's actually socialism. And 
you know, this is why they're going wrong because they they're, they're approaching it from the wrong they're approaching it from a biased perspective, and their narrative that fascism because this isn't even fascism, this isn't even fa- this is national socialism, which is different. Fascism and national socialism are two different things, but they can't even see it because they have no idea what they're talking about. And Stalin, which is why I've got him pictured there, Stalin is the is the one who said <clears throat> fascism is the end stage of capitalism. Well, it it isn't. People are saying to me that I'm wrong. Okay, give me a good argument that actually works. Because this argument does not work. It doesn't work. The the current traditional narrative doesn't work, and I'm not convinced by it. So, no. At least, at the very sense, my argument that Hitler's economy was, in fact, socialist, makes sense. 